Good morning. The first pause in fighting since the outbreak of war between Israel and Hamas seems to be holding. But can the diplomatic breakthrough be used as a stepping stone toward a permanent ceasefire? It's Morning Edition from NPR News. Let's have a look back at Rosalind Carter's role in shining a light on mental health. Amy Martinez, in this hour, we remember how the late former First Lady fought to eliminate discrimination toward people with mental illnesses. Also in Nigeria, there's a growing demand for answers about the sudden death of an Afro pop star. And on StoryCorps, a son talks with his father about why he got into the family business. It's Friday, November 24th. Happy birthday to a former NBA great, Oscar Robertson. The big O turns 85. News is next. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Windsor Johnston. The Israeli military, hospitals and social workers are preparing to receive a group of hostages expected to be released by Hamas in Gaza today. Qatar says 13 Israeli hostages will be released. In exchange, Israel will release Palestinian prisoners. NPR's Daniel Estrin reports from Tel Aviv. The Israeli military released images of the helicopter with two rows of noise-canceling headphones ready to take the freed Israeli hostages to a military reception center. Then they'll be taken to hospitals where they'll be reunited with their families. Social workers will be on hand to break the news that some of their friends and relatives were killed in the Hamas attacks October 7th. Sarit Sarfati from Israel's Welfare Ministry spoke to reporters. We will have to break the news to them very soon. This is something that cannot be delayed because uh, we don't want them to find out the bad and the sad news by rumors. Hamas says it will release a total of some 50 women and children over the next four days, and Israel will release 150 Palestinian prisoners and detainees, women and minors. Daniel Estrin, NPR News, Tel Aviv. A negotiated temporary pause in fighting is allowing people in Gaza to begin assessing the damage after more than six weeks of Israeli airstrikes in the region. NPR's Anas Baba reports that Palestinians are returning to their homes for the first time since Hamas attacked southern Israel on October 7th. The people that lived in the southern eastern, their houses, because it's very close to the borders, they took their belongings from the schools, and they are like heading back to their houses, maybe to, to, to just to see it or to have a look on it. NPR's Andes Baba reporting from Gaza. Dozens of people were arrested after a night of violent protests in the Irish capital of Dublin. Villa Marx reports far-right demonstrators took to the streets to protest a knife attack outside of a school that left several people wounded, including three children. The knife attack in the city centre had several people wounded, three of them young children. But the rioting that followed was severe and unexpected, Ireland's police chief has said, with more than a dozen stores damaged. Three buses were burned and several police vehicles destroyed in what the country's top police officer called, quote, huge destruction from a riotous mob that was driven by, quote, far-right ideology. The country's deputy prime minister praised emergency workers but called the country's modern and inclusive society, quote, something precious that should be protected. Police say they prepared for more violence, but would conduct a fundamental review of their tactics in light of this event they did not anticipate. For NPR News, I'm Bill and Marks. Stocks across Asia traded mostly lower today. On Wall Street, Dow futures are trading higher. This is NPR News in Washington. A new study finds overdose deaths during pregnancy and just after childbirth went up in the United States from 2018 through 2021. Martha Biebinger with member station WBUR reports the increase occurred as the overall number of drug-related deaths in the country hit record highs. The most dramatic increases were among Native Americans and pregnant people aged 35 to 44. Deaths shortly after birth nearly doubled for drug users. The study is from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Deputy Director Dr. Wilson Compton says many pregnant women avoid treatment and prenatal care because they're afraid authorities will take their baby. This has profound implications for the way we uh, discourage, directly or indirectly, women from seeking care uh, during pregnancy. Compton says making addiction treatment medications more available to pregnant women and easing punitive threats would save lives. 
For NPR News, I'm Martha Biebinger. Search and rescue operations continue after a landslide struck a small fishing village in southeastern Alaska. Emergency teams are using dogs, planes, drones and helicopters to locate three people who remain missing. Three others were confirmed dead. Emergency crews in Australia are working to contain a wildfire that's burning along the coastal city of Perth. Officials say more than a dozen homes and 30 other structures have been destroyed. The cause of the blaze is under investigation. This is NPR News in Washington. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, recognizing exceptionally creative individuals. This year's MacArthur Fellows and more information are at macfound.org. This is NPR. And this is North Country Public Radio. It's about five after eight. Good morning. I'm Monica Sandreski. Coming up in just a few minutes on Morning Edition, former First Lady Rosalind Carter persistently fought to put care for mental and physical health on equal footing and to eliminate discrimination toward people with mental illnesses. We'll take a look back at that legacy coming up in just a few minutes right here on North Country Public Radio, which is supported by the Adirondack Land Trust, working with communities to protect trails and open spaces for the benefit of all adirondacklandtrust.org and by the cloud splitter foundation recognizing eagle island camp and their commitment to providing an environmentally responsible and unplugged camp experience for girls and young women more at eagleisland.org This is Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm e. Martinez in Los Angeles, California. A four-day pause in the conflict between Israel and Hamas appears to be underway. It's part of a deal that will allow for the release of at least 50 hostages seized by Hamas during last month's attack on Israel. Israel, in return, will release 150 Palestinian women and children from Israeli jails. The deal was brokered by Qatar with support from the United States and Egypt and has been described as a major diplomatic breakthrough. But what will its lasting impact be? For more, we're joined this morning by Jonathan Panikoff. He's a former U.S. intelligence officer and director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council's Middle East Program. Jonathan, if this pause holds, we'll expect to see the first hostages released later this morning and then additional releases over the course of the next uh, four days. Why is this staggered approach the way to go? Good morning. The reason for the staggered approach is that it will help ensure confidence on both sides. In other words, there's obviously a fear that if uh, by Hamas, that if if they released the 50 Israeli hostages or foreign hostages, depending on the makeup of the group, um, would Israel actually go ahead and release all their hostages? Would the ceasefire hold and, and vice versa? If Hamas releases some and Israel releases some now, then it great, gives both sides greater confidence and allows for there to be insurity that both sides will keep to their words and their commitments that were made in the Doha document. Yeah, it's agonizing for families, though, that have to wait and see uh, over the next few days. Um, It's been nearly eight weeks, though, since the Hamas attack. What's been the biggest challenge in negotiating this hostage release? Well, first of all, it's not a direct negotiation, as you said. Because it's going through Qatar, it's taking some time. It means Qatar is really going back and forth uh, between Israel, between Hamas, between the U.S., between Egypt. And so that obviously adds quite a bit of time. Uh, But also just on the ground, facts have changed things. So Israel's military actions have changed the timing that uh, Hamas and Israel were engaging for a time. And then Israel stepped up actions, including at Shifa Hospital lately. Conversely, Hamas had taken actions early on and kept pushing off negotiations. It wouldn't give a list of who was being held originally to Israel. So there's been a number of challenges on both sides that have had to be worked through. 
Do you think if Israel had not responded in the way that it has, that we might have gotten here quicker? No, I, I don't. I, I think a lot of the hold up was really on the Hamas side. I, I think obviously on the ground had an impact, but I think Hamas dragged its feet, which has been a long held uh, strategy over the years by the group. You'll remember that they held a former Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, for over five and a quarter years. And Israel had to trade over a thousand people, including 280 serving life sentences uh, back in 2011 to, to get him out. So Hamas is very, very comfortable having the hostages. It's used to having the hostages. It views it as the best leverage that the group has. How did the Qatar get involved in all this? Qatar has long been wanting to play a role and has been playing a role throughout the region as a mediator. Qatar is such a small state, a population of about 300,000, second highest GDP per capita in the world. It feels that it can use, frankly, its position, uh, not only in the region, but globally to be a mediator. And it has done so now for a number of years on a variety of conflicts. Um, Hamas has been reliant on Qatar to transfer funds to the group for a number of years that was part of an Israeli strategy and with Israeli acquiescence, the goal was to keep things in the Gaza Strip at a slightly low simmering level, enough funds for Hamas to stay in control and to keep things calm. Obviously, that strategy did not work, but they've had a long relationship with Hamas uh, because of that. Jonathan, quickly, what are the chances this pause can become permanent? I think it's probably unlikely. The, the reality is nothing about this pause does anything to ensure Israel's long-term security, and that's what its military goals are being used for. Uh, so in the end, I expect that you'll see, uh, unfortunately, resumption of fighting um, at the end. Jonathan Panikoff is a former U.S. intelligence officer and director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council's Middle East Program. Jonathan, thanks. Thank you. And for more coverage and for differing views and analysis of the conflict, go to npr.org slash Middle East Updates. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter championed many causes during her lifetime, but she held a special place in her heart for mental health. Many on the front lines of mental health advocacy say her legacy will be that she held on to hope despite numerous setbacks. Reporter Christine Herman explains. Rosalind Carter was the nation's first prominent political figure to sound the alarm about the inadequacies of the mental health system. Half a century ago, people were ashamed to talk about mental illness, but Mrs. Carter did not shy away. She imagined that we would have mental health treatment just the same way that people were going to the doctors for their physical health. Dr. Rebecca Brendel is past president of the American Psychiatric Association. She says the landmark Mental Health Systems Act that Mrs. Carter championed while President Carter was in office was a game changer. It called for major investments in community-based mental health treatment. The measure passed, but would later be stripped of funding after President Reagan took office in the 80s. Brendel says if that hadn't happened... We would be in a very different place than we are really playing catch-up in making mental health services available to every American. Despite the setback, Rosalind Carter persisted. Eve Bird, director of the Carter Center's mental health program, says Mrs. Carter often told stories about how hard it was, even as first lady, to get people to sit down and talk about mental health. I think what sets her apart is that she recognized the stigma and really more so the discriminatory behaviors that um, come from that stigma. It would be another three decades before community mental health treatment would be federally funded again through the Affordable Care Act signed into law by President Obama in 2010. Before the ACA, Rosalind Carter lobbied for another federal bill, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. It would require insurance companies to cover mental illness on par with other medical issues. Then-Congressman Patrick Kennedy co-sponsored the measure. He says the Parity Act passed in part because it got tacked onto the $700 billion bailout for banks aimed at stabilizing the economy, but also because Mrs. Carter came to Capitol Hill to testify in support of the measure. I don't think we passed it because there was any great outcry to finally end the separate and unequal treatment of those who have a brain illness versus another illness of their body. 
there was just really not a whole lot of other people coming in with any kind of celebrity at all wanting to associate themselves with this cause. Fast forward to 2023, and there are many examples of how Rosalind Carter's labors over so many years have come to bear fruit. Earlier this year, the Biden administration strengthened a rule to make insurance cover mental health care. Dr. Brendel with the American Psychiatric Association says Mrs. Carter's efforts also helped spur federal funding for research on mental illnesses. There's also the new national three-digit mental health crisis line, 988. That parallels uh, emergency medical services and can put any American and every American in touch with a trained crisis counselor when they're experiencing any kind of mental health crisis or emergency. And her mental health work was not limited to the U.S. In the early 2000s, she focused on Liberia. Here's Carter Center's Eve Bird again. We have been in Liberia for 15 years, going from one psychiatrist to over 350 clinicians, help them pass their first mental health law. Beyond policy, Dr. Brendel is grateful to Mrs. Carter for her life as an example of compassion and dedication for anyone who hopes to bring about lasting change. We have to stick with it. It doesn't happen overnight. And her legacy will always be that she stuck with it right until the end. For NPR News, I'm Christine Herman. Turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, and even sweet pecan pie melting in your chunky cheeks. It was all so delicious yesterday. Today, not so much. All you're getting is mine. You went back for seconds and thirds of everything just hours ago. Today, you can't even look at another bite, even though you feel a little guilty. In the U.S., up to 40% of the food we produce goes uneaten. Anne-Marie Bonneau is the author of the cookbook, The Zero Waste Chef. Her ideas for your leftovers go beyond turkey sandwiches and pie for breakfast. She says you can find a way to use everything on the table right down to the cranberry sauce. I like to make my own fruit bottom yogurt with it. It's delicious. So I'll just take a big spoonful and put it in a small dish and top it with yogurt. Bono says you can even use that unfinished bottle of wine. You can make really delicious vinegar from leftover wine. Let's say you have a cup left over. You can stir in a few tablespoons of apple cider vinegar and let it sit for about a month and you'll have delicious vinegar. Bono says to think of your Thanksgiving leftovers as resources. Save the turkey bones and make broth. When you're prepping, you can save the little bits and pieces of vegetables and you can either freeze them or you can use them right away to make free vegetable broth. She recommends putting some pastry dough over turkey leftovers and gravy to make a turkey pot pie or even turkey shepherd's pie if you have uneaten mashed potatoes. But what happens on day three or day four when eating leftover turkey feels like a chore? Use the freezer. Freeze that leftover turkey. Take it out a couple of weeks later or a month later and cook something new with it. And don't forget, there's no reason your household has to shoulder this burden alone. I would tell guests, bring a container. Who doesn't like leftover Thanksgiving dinner? And don't be afraid to employ a little guilt. Remember, finishing up all those leftovers is good for the planet. So win, win. This is NPR News. You're listening to Morning Edition right here on North Country Public Radio. It's about 20 after 8. Good morning. So glad that you could start your day 
with our community's public radio station, NCPR. Coming up on Morning Edition in about 15 minutes, the Israel-Hamas war has complicated Israel's relations with some Arab countries that had begun to formally normalize relations with the Jewish state. We'll get more context for this story coming up from Jackie Northam at uh, 8.34 right here on NCPR, which is supported by the Depot Theatre Westport, a professional uh, equity uh, equity theatre in the Adirondacks, celebrating its 45th season in uh, depotheater.org. Support also comes from St. Lawrence Health, whose clinical and rural research health team is conducting clinical trials to advance medicine in the North Country and beyond. Learn more at stlawrencehealthsystem.org. And by Seacom Credit Union, serving the financial needs of people throughout Northern New York and Vermont in person, online at seacom.org and on your smartphone. NPR comes from this station and from Workday, an enterprise management cloud focused on providing organizations with a system to continuously plan for all what-if scenarios. Workday, the finance, HR, and planning system for a changing world. From Procter & Gamble, maker of Nervive Nerve Relief. Nervive is designed to reduce occasional nerve aches, weakness, and discomfort in hands or feet due to aging. Learn more at NerviveHealth.com. From BritBox with Payback, a new original crime thriller from the creator of Line of Duty and Bodyguard, starring Grant Chester's Morvan Christie and Ozark's Peter Mullen. Streaming at BritBox.com slash NPR. And from the Doris Duke Foundation. This is Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm E. Martinez. Lots of great Black Friday deals are hiding in plain sight. You just got to know where to look. Turns out some of the best deals are in places where you never expect. We're not talking about Target, Walmart, or Amazon, or Best Buy. That's Joni Demmer, co-founder of the website CrazyCouponLady.com. There are so many places that you wouldn't expect that are trying to get a piece of your Black Friday budget and are having some great sales to attract you. Demmer says surprising Black Friday bargains could be found right around the corner at your neighborhood drugstore. CVS is great for gift cards. CVX is also the place that has $5 Conair appliances. So we're talking about a curling iron that's regularly 20 bucks will be only $5. And Walgreens is a fun one because they've got $10 back on every $35 spent. You're going to be in that 70, 80% off range if you're willing to play the game. But if you're looking for the real deal, what you doing looking at him? Ain't nothing but a cheap thrill. He can love you like time will. Demmer says you can also find great deals at home improvement stores. And we're not just talking monkey wrenches and power tools. Lowe's actually comes in with some of the most exciting deals. They've got one quart poinsettias for $1.50. They've got wreaths for $10. And they have seven to eight foot live Christmas trees for $63. Nobody's going to come close to those prices. How much is that dog in the window? (laughs) The one with the waggly tail. Pet stores really, really get in on the game. And the interesting thing here is it seems to be a rivalry with Amazon that's pushing down prices. Both pet stores are watching what Amazon's doing. Amazon is watching back. But that competition has really created some opportunities. And so while this is about unexpected places, the thing is, sometimes it's the unexpected place that starts the deal. And then you can get the convenience of Amazon once they match it. I do hope that doggies for sale. Demmer says another unexpected place for Black Friday bargains is your local auto parts store. We've noticed one of the best-selling items this time of year is wiper blades. So both O'Reilly Auto Parts and AutoZone both have great deals. O'Reilly wins. They've got $20 gift card with any wiper blades that you purchase. 
Now's the time to do it. Warranty is in the sack, and you can always take me back and go window shopping again. Window shopping again. Demmer says the best way to save money on Black Friday is to just stay home. 97% of the deals are available online. So we're seeing some gimmicks trying to get people back in stores. But for me, the way that it's easier for me to stick to a budget is actually staying home. And what could be better on Black Friday than saving money and wear and tear on your feet? I got 10 toy soldiers for Billy Joe. I got a color and look for Sue. I got a little toy train for Danny Boy and a cowboy suit for Lou. I got a talking baby doll for Cindy. I got a pair of roller skates for Jane. And baby, if we ever have any more kids, Christmas shopping's gonna drive me insane. Among the retailers mentioned in this story, Amazon is a supporter of NPR. The Walton Family Foundation, which was started by the founders of Walmart, is also a sponsor of NPR. It's Friday, time for StoryCorps. This week, a look back at father and son locksmiths. Phil and Philip Mortolaro run Greenwich Locksmiths in Manhattan. Phil has been locking and unlocking things since he was 14 years old. He opened his Greenwich Village shop in 1980. All five of his children spent time there. Philip, his youngest son, decided to follow in his father's footsteps. They came to StoryCorps back in 2014 to talk about locksmithing together. I was one of those kids who would show up when school first started, and they would see me again around Christmas time, and then they would see me in June to tell me that I had to do the grade over again. So dropping out of school, was, it was inevitable. And as far as you doing the business, you started younger than me. As soon as I could walk. Even before you were walking. Yeah, I, was, I got pictures of you in the shop when you were in the bassinet. I was literally there since day one. I saw you do it. I was like, okay, I can do this. Then I kind of realized, man, you know, everyone loves my dad one half of that is you know because he's a great guy the other half is like you know he's the guy who helps you and even other locksmiths can't help i have a sense of usefulness and that's the big thing in my noodle is that you always have to feel like i have some worth i'm not just saying this you're the most hard-working tenacious person yeah, i know that comes from coming from immigrant parents you can never work hard enough even when you're working seven days a week they say you're a little lazy think about it Philip. when am i ever late Never. When do I ever take vacations? No, never. And when am I going to retire? One day before your funeral. You know it. (laughs) You know, if you ever didn't want to do this, you know, I would never be heartbroken. I would understand. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? My father, he hated my business, man. You know, I had a cousin who became an accountant, and my father used to tell me about him all the time. But um, I think it was the, the founder of IBM. He said, I'm no genius, but I'm bright in spots, and I stay around those spots. I like that. You raised all of us, man. Five kids and every single one of them did not ever want for anything, man. That's hard to do for someone who just went up to the eighth grade. Well, you do your best, kid. This is what you do. But honestly, your best. Not not just a BS best. And even if you fail, it doesn't feel that bad. You're always my barometer. You've never let anyone down. That's what sets you apart. That's Philip and Phil Mortolaro in New York City in 2014. Phil still insists he has no plans to retire. Their interview is archived in the Library of Congress. Major support for StoryCorps comes from Subaru. The Subaru Share the Love event runs through January 2nd. By year's end, Subaru and its retailers will have donated over $285 million to charity. Subaru.com slash share. And from Dignity Memorial, helping families plan life celebrations now so their loved ones are protected later because nobody should have to plan for a loss while they're experiencing one. Learn more at DignityMemorial.com. This is NPR News. There are a lot of suitcases for airlines to keep track of. And if one goes missing for long enough, everything in it ends up at a huge store in Alabama. Even a fraction of a percent of all lost items is going to accumulate quickly when you consider that millions of people travel every single day. Our reporter digs through your old luggage on All Things Considered from NPR News. 
Join us for ATC this evening between 5 and 7 o'clock right here on North Country Public Radio. Good morning. It's 8.30. Monica Sandresky, so glad you could join us. Support for the station comes from the Adirondack Foundation, connecting people, ideas, and resources to improve lives and expand opportunities throughout the Adirondack region. Details at adirondackfoundation.org and by NCC Systems, protecting North Country businesses and homes for 50 years, offering cameras, security, fire alarms, and entry control, nccsystems.com.